Easter Sunday, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, but Christ, has indeed, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. As we celebrate Easter, we begin recognizing Paul's words and how Paul's words had been taken up in one of the earliest of the church's confessions of faith, when in Easter the person leading the service would say, Christ is risen. And the response is, Christ is Sorry, the response is, He is risen indeed. So let's try that. We won't hear one another, but you can belt it out. Let your neighbors or whoever's um, around uh, hear. This is good news. This is Easter news. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And that will be the response um, during our opening prayer. And we'll gather up the words of our prayer in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Loving, living God, we praise You for the good news of Easter. We rejoice in the triumphant message of resurrection, of new hope, new joy, new life. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We praise You for what becomes real for us through Easter, what is brought to us and, and given us through Easter. Your love reaches us, for it could not be kept down. Your purpose is given to us, for your will could not be defeated. Your goodness is made real for us because it could not be destroyed. Your mercy reaches us because it could not be frustrated. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And we praise and thank you that Easter is not just a story of long ago, but brings to us a living Savior, brings to us new beginnings, brings to us the chance for life transformation, brings to us renewal, brings to us solid hope. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Accept our praise for all you have done in Christ, for the riches you've given us of being sons and daughters of the living God, joint heirs with Christ, for the belonging of being sons and daughters of the living God, for the assurance of love through being sons and daughters of the living God. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Forgive us, gracious God, when we have made little of your salvation, when our praise has been muted, when we have lost the sense of being part of your family, when we have given in to temptation, refused to carry our cross, when our response has been compromised and half-hearted. For when we have forgotten your love, your call, and your purposes for us. Forgive us through your Son who died bearing our sins, and whose resurrection declares to us his overcoming and assures us that we have forgiveness and peace. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And we gather up our prayers in the words that Jesus taught His followers. Our Father in heaven. <coughs> During the um, season of Lent, for the main part, we've been following a series in the prophet Isaiah, 
And we've been um, very grateful for a book that Tim Chester um, had written for the, the, the beauty of the cross. And as well as writing that book on these chapters in Isaiah, uh, he also wrote a, a hymn which um, we've been using pretty much as a theme hymn um, during our series. So we've, we've sang it quite a few times um, since the beginning of March, and we sing it again as we finish this series in this section of Isaiah. The hymn is See Jesus Stripped of Majesty, and after we've sung the hymn, we'll be hearing the scriptures read to us. See Jesus Stripped of Majesty He hangs disfigured on a tree Sound. In mockery with violence crowned, a sacrificial offering, atoning for his people's sin. Oh, what amazing love! I bow before the cross, my pride reaches to dust. What verses 1 to 13. Invitation to the thirsty. Come, all of you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen, that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found, call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will be freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth, and making it bud and flourish, 
so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper, and instead of briars the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Amen. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. What did you do yesterday? For a number of folk in our congregation, Saturdays we went coffee mornings here. Maybe people used Saturdays generally to visit relatives. Some of you would use Saturdays for a, an outing to the shops. Sports lovers would maybe have matches or games to take part in or to enjoy. But not yesterday. No gatherings, no outings, no events. It was, like the past few Saturdays, a strange one. But also yesterday was Easter Saturday. Sandwiched between the all too horrible but yet marvelous events of Good Friday. Between that and the glorious awakening and announcement of the gospel triumph as Jesus rose on Easter Sunday, between that Friday and Sunday comes Easter Saturday. A kind of waiting day. Uh, nothing very much happens today, day. Well, some of us are finding that they have far too many days like that just now. With all the restrictions of lockdown, quite a few days might feel like Easter Saturday for many of us. And we wait for the release. We will wait for the freedom from COVID-19, for the fear to be taken away, the freedom restored, the way open to a fuller life. Actually, all of these quite typical Easter themes. But whatever is the Christian response to where we find ourselves, simply waiting for time to pass is not an option. Waiting and inactivity, longing for change but not giving ourselves to seeking change, are not gospel responses to anything at all. They are not what Easter people are called to do. So how do we live Easter? How do we live Easter Sunday in the waiting time? The time when things are or when things seem to be on us, on top of us, on the Saturday. Which is it? Saturday, Sunday? Well, the first day of the week. In John chapter 20, the second of our readings and the shorter of our readings, in John chapter 20, there are two episodes. In the first of these, Jesus meets Mary in the garden outside the tomb. And in the second, Jesus appears later on to the disciples. And that episode, that part is repeated again a week later when Jesus comes to them again when Thomas is present. And both of these episodes begin with a reference, verse 1 and verse 19, to the first day of the week. 
John does that quite a lot in his gospel. He gives you a a little bit of detail, and he's not giving you just a bit of information. He's actually saying something much more. And so it is in John chapter 20 with these two references to the first day of the week. John is not simply saying, oh, by the way, it was Sunday. The first day of the week has connections back, and we will understand it better if we can first of all recall how John's gospel began. Do you remember? John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, which of course echoes back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And John then followed up that connection in chapter 1 in these early verses when he talked about light and life. Here, John is announcing, here is the story of how creation is to be renewed. Here is a story that's not a new story, it's picking up on that one story that begins with creation. Here is the story of how all the wrong done by sin is going to be undone. Here is the story of how a broken world is going to be put back together again. Here is the story about how all that God wanted and all that God intended is going to come to pass. It has gone wrong. It needed to be put right. And now it has, declares John. God's world has been delivered, restored, made new, saved through the death and the rising of Jesus. It was, he says, the first day of the week. It is the new creation beginning. It is the fresh start promised in the Old Testament prophets, not least promised in Isaiah chapter 55. Jesus rising from the dead was not just some happy ending after the events of Holy Week. It is a glorious announcement that as Jesus himself had said on the cross, it is finished, it is done with, I have overcome. God is victorious. And the rising of Jesus is also the first fruits of a new creation made possible because Jesus finished, because Jesus overcame the forces of corruption and decay. And the gospel promise is that God will do for all His people, and God will do for all of creation what He did for Jesus that first Easter Sunday resurrection will come. New life awaits. Not merely coming back to life like Lazarus, then to die again, and certainly not just our souls somehow continuing in some non-bodily life forevermore. No, in the beginning is linked to first day of the week, to say that God's recreation, His completing of the purposes of redemption, are both with us here and now, though only in part. But we can have real solid hope for their completion at the end of time. The first day of the week, resurrection, recreation is on the way. But why why are these fruits of the new creation not all here now? Why was Easter Saturday necessary, or even was it necessary? Well, of course, one thing that Easter Saturday emphasizes is that Jesus really did die on the cross, although not even Easter Saturday is enough for some people. For some have come up with the idea, trying to explain away the resurrection, that Jesus didn't really die on the cross, that although He'd been wounded, remember He had a spear stuck in His side, although He'd been wounded, although He was worn out, worn out by the terrible agonies that are crucifixion, even though He was stuck away without any medical care, no food and no water for a couple of days, He somehow came to life and pushed away the stone from inside the tomb and then escaped without the guards noticing. Or maybe he overpowered these experienced Roman soldiers. 
Well, you don't need faith to believe that version of events. You just need stupidity. Now, the waiting of Saturday, which, of course, fulfilled the Jewish Sabbath laws, also made clear that Je what Jesus had gone through. Jesus really had died. But there is a bigger question here. It is, why, if God was wanting to restore His creation, why, if God was wanting to put the wrong right, why was Jesus rising simply the first fruit, simply the beginning? Why did God not sort it all out right there and then? Well, we're reminded in verses 8 and 9 of Isaiah chapter 55 that God's ways are very different. And not just are they different, they're better. For in this time between the rising of Jesus and the return of Jesus, here is a time for people to find the truth of this gospel, to become part of the kingdom of God. It's a time for us to find our place and our part in the story. And so comes the invitation at the beginning of Isaiah chapter 55. Come, 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 come. Four times in that one verse, Isaiah says, come. This is urgent. This is important. This is good news. This is a great offer, a better offer than you're ever going to get elsewhere. It's an invitation for all people everywhere. Nations that you know not, verse 5, will be summoned. Isaiah shouts it out four times, not least because there's a lot of competition. He's like, you know, the market trader you used to see in a busy market as you, as you walk down through the stalls of the market, so there'd be people trying to advertise what they were selling. Two for the price of one, 30% off, come and get your grapes, only such and such a pound, and, and so on. All these voices crying out, and it's as if Isaiah's in amongst all of that, and he's shouting, come, 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 come. Because people do get distracted, and go to the other stalls. People, people opt for other things for peace and happiness. People seek fulfillment in a career, or their sex life, their possessions, their leisure pursuits, their relationships. Now, all of these are good things. None of them is intrinsically evil. But none of them are God. None of them are a source of eternal peace. And none of them bring, bring peace in a way that is overall part of a big peace for all of creation. For each of them do harm as well as do good. Careers often come at the cost to family life or a cost to other people who are overlooked for promotion. We hear plenty of negative fallouts and consequences of sex gone wrong, of illicit affairs, unwanted pregnancies, disease, and the evil of prostitution and sex trafficking. Possessions are often got, yes, by our hard-won earnings, but often we're learning, but too slowly, but learning, we get them at a cost to the environment a cost to those who work in sweatshops elsewhere. We get them at a cost to those who maybe cannot have what we have but want it and find themselves going into incredible debt to get it. Leisure pursuits damage as well as provide enjoyment. Many a small rural community, for example, in our country is on its knees now because there's so many second homes bought. There's not been the business through all the year to keep the shop open, etc., etc. And in many other parts of the world, the opulence of tourists is a sickening reminder to the locals of their entrapment in poverty. Relationships can, and they do sour, cause grief and hurt and nastiness. And each of these things, which is good, but each of them also harms. And they are not sources of fulfillment for everyone. They are not accompanied by justice. And they are not everlasting. 
But here, says Isaiah, is something that is. Here is God's salvation. So come and get it, he offers. Make sure that it's not just something that God has done, but something that you take and receive and become part of. And these other things that you might pursue, seeking fulfillment and happiness, they cost. You have to work hard to get a successful career. You have to be good. You have to watch your P's and Q's in many a relationship. You have to keep yourself looking young and attractive to others, or spending hours training to keep fit, and so on and so on. Now, again, the things might not be wrong in themselves, but the point is they are not God and they are not God's salvation, and they are not the fruits of Easter. So, what does God demand that, so that you may get the fruits of Easter, that you can have resurrection life in His new creation? Simply that you come. There is nothing to pay, verse 1, because, and this we looked at back in chapter 53 a few weeks ago, God has paid for it in the sacrifice of His servant. So, why invest yourself? Why spend on that which ultimately cannot provide peace and fullness of life, asks Isaiah, verse 2. For God is willing Verses 6 and 7 of the passage tell us that. They have words like, He may be found, He is near, will show mercy, will freely pardon. But these verses also have a warning. While He may be found implies that there will be a time when He cannot be found, a day when the market is shut when the whole of creation completes that transition from Saturday to Easter Sunday, and then it will be too late to seek, too late to choose. So, here, Isaiah's urgency, come now to Christ, the living Savior, who is the first fruits of the new creation, who brings in this salvation that will be based on justice and fairness and peace and harmony, not just for a few, but for all who are in His kingdom. And you enter His kingdom freely. You don't have to pay you simply recognize that Jesus paid it on the cross and accept that free gift. But still, there's a bit of Saturday around, isn't there? The promises in the second half of Isaiah 55 are promises that are future ones. Had it been up to us, and thank the Lord it wasn't up to us, but were it up to us, we might have wrapped everything up right away. But then there would have been no invite to the nations, no opportunity for people to come, to see, and to find. God's salvation, verses 8 and 9, turns our ideas and our notions upside down and inside out, and we saw that as we looked in the, in the, earlier in our series in Isaiah 53. And if you missed them, the sermons are still available online. God's ways are different and more loving for all. And His ways and His Word, verses 10 and 11 tell us, will bear fruit. There were in Isaiah 53 promises about a servant, and much later than when Isaiah had written these words, Jesus came. And Jesus fulfilled all that Isaiah had spoken of in that chapter. And in fact, Jesus did more than Isaiah said in that chapter. And so too, God's promises of new creation, of resurrection for all His people will come to pass. That is what is being declared. More than that, that is what is being begun as the resurrected Jesus walks out of the tomb that first Easter Sunday. The day is still to come, verse 13 of Isaiah 50, 55, as he looks forward to the transformation and when the thorn bush will grow the juniper and instead of briars the myrtle will grow. Of course, the thorn bush, verse 13, represents the curse, the intrusion of evil into the world. See that back in Genesis chapter 3 at verse 18. The day is coming, says Isaiah, when the curse will be reversed and creation will be made new. In the meantime, 
Just as Jesus entered into our sinful world, and just as Jesus brought the kingdom of God realities and values to bear on everyday life, so now that is for the church, the followers of Jesus, the people of God to do. We are not in our Easter Saturday to sit back and wait, twiddling our thumbs, hoping for something to change. The church is called to bear the hurts, the joys, the trials, the opportunities of the world. We are to call out to the world to come, but also, as Jesus did, enter into the realities of the world and live with and among them. Now, I hope to say something more midweek, putting something out midweek to say something more about our response in the time of the um, pandemic. But for now, to say just in these times, even though we live with the promise of Easter, and without denying any of the gospel promises of the Holy Spirit with us and so on, and without denying anything of the taste of eternity that is in the here and now, we should also be dealing with and offering up the sense that things have gone wrong, and we should be learning better how to lament how far we have strayed, how far the values of Easter have been overtaken, been overtaken as so many people have refused the invitation to come. And we should learn better how to lament, because we as a society have spent so much, verse 2 of 55, Isaiah 55, we have spent so much on that which does not satisfy. To lament and to take the reality of the kingdom of God into everyday life is a big, big call, a huge task. It asks us to pursue beauty, to be reconcilers, to engage in causes for justice, to care for creation, to celebrate all that is good and worthy, and also to lament with the hearts of the world, but also to say, come, Christ is ready and willing to receive. We need to lament that this Easter weekend, so much of the world's experience is of Saturday, of death and decay, and not of Easter renewal. Worse, we need to lament that so much of the church's experience this Easter is just the death and decay of Saturday and not an Easter renewal. And so we must throw ourselves on to the mercy of God, and that too costs nothing. And we must pick up the call and the challenge that just as Jesus, via the suffering servant way, identified with His people and brought the good news to many, so too will God today still work in our world through His servants, through His people. Today we have Easter Sunday because the suffering servant of Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering servant Jesus was willing to pay the price, willing to engage on God's behalf, would that more of our society, more of our friends, more of our networks, more of our community could taste something of the reality of Easter Sunday because the people of God have learned, learned from Jesus to share, to identify, to enter into the Saturday experience in order that for the sake of others, the hope and the goodness of the gospel might yet be tasted. Let us pray. So, gracious God, might we know both the joy and also the challenge of Easter. And if, Lord, we are folk who have not yet come, folks who have not yet given our lives to Jesus, might we seek Him while He may be found, remembering that for those who seek, He is near, He will show mercy, He will freely pardon. 
Amen. Uh, service continues with that theme of invitation. Come, people of the risen King, is our hymn. And after we've sung this hymn, we will confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed, um, and then we shall be led in prayer. I believe. This technology works. God, I thought this morning I would FaceTime you. Can't see you or hear you, but I know you're there. I know you can see and hear me. Now, this time in our service, Lord, you know we usually pray for other people, but seeing as how it's just you and me that are here. I wonder if I could be maybe a wee bit more personal in my prayers and pray for friends and family. And I start by praying for my work colleague who buried her husband this week, a victim of coronavirus. Father, 
there were only five people at the funeral. Five people to celebrate a life of 72 years. That can't be right. Only five people. And you, of course, you were there. And I thank you for that. I thank you for your words of comfort. Peace be with you. And in the days and weeks that lie ahead, difficult times for Sandra and the family, I pray that they might be comforted by the memories of Ian. And I pray that they might hear your voice. Peace be with you. I'd like to pray for my sister who's terminally ill. I want you to thank you for the pharmacologists who have developed drugs which are giving her, her some relief from pain and extending her life. And thank you too for the care team who are looking after her. Thank you for her, for her bravery in this situation and for her sense of humour too. I pray that she might continue to experience relief from pain and that she might enjoy these days. And I pray that she might hear you speaking to her, saying peace be with you. Pray for members of the family who now find themselves unemployed or in furlough. And I pray that in this time of idleness, they won't be idle, but they'll find new ways, new skills to develop, new opportunities to contribute. I'm thankful, Father, that um, we are affluent enough that we're able to support and help them. But I'm aware too that there are others in our society who are just as needy and don't perhaps have the financial support of family. And so I thank you for organisations like Loaves and Fishes and the Food Bank. What were these words from earlier? Come, buy, eat. buy with no money. Thank you that these organisations allow people to buy with no money. Father, make me as generous in my support of these organisations as I am in supporting my own family. I'd like to thank you for my daughter-in-law my new wee superhero. I thank you for Jen working in intensive care, going in there in her shift to risk her life because she loves you and she loves her job. I thank you for the love and care and compassion she shares with her patients. I thank you for her and her colleagues and others like them throughout the country, throughout the world. I pray that you would protect them, keep them safe. I pray you give them the strength they need to get through their long shifts, physical strength, emotional strength too. I pray that in their days off, they might be able to refresh and relax and they might experience that peace, peace that only you can give. Pray too for mum, sitting there in her room in the housing complex, no longer able to mingle with other residents no longer having friends or family dropping by for a few minutes for a wee chat to drop off the newspapers. Very lonely existence. One day the same as the previous and the next. 
I thank you that she has her Bible beside her and that in there she can find comfort and strength and hope. I pray that uh, you would ease her worries, worries about the family, worries about the future. I pray that you'd speak to her. Peace be with you. And I thank you for my grandchildren. It's all very well having a FaceTime conversation with them, but it's not anything like sharing a cuddle with them. They too are missing out just now, missing out on friends from school or playgroup. Thank you for their parents and for the innovative ways they are finding of educating and entertaining their children. And I pray that even in these days, they might continue to grow in strength and in wisdom and in favour with man and with you. I guess my family is not much different from many other families around. And I guess that uh, my prayers would be the prayers of other people too. And as I think about my friends and my family on this Easter Sunday, it's more like Christmas and Easter. When I think of all of the good gifts that uh, you have given to me, yeah, it's Christmas all over again. Ye Lord, we greet thee, risen this happy morning. Jesus, to thee be glory given. Father, I want to give you glory. I pray that you would take me and use me to bring glory to your name. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son. And it's in the name of that risen Saviour I pray these things. Amen. Again, for our notices, it's to highlight that we are not able to gather, but do it where you can um, join us online or join us by, by phone um, for our services. Also, do take the opportunity to uh, let us know if there's anything that we can be praying for. And also, if there's anything that we can, folks need help with, um, we have a no number of folks who have indicated that they're prepared to, to do shopping or, or get, get prescriptions for folks. Um, so if you have it, no if you or if somebody you know has any needs on those areas, just please contact us through, through the church office. Although Leslie's working um, at home, she is still working and, and, and con collecting information. So anything at all, please do get in touch. And then just before we were coming to record our service today, um, we came across this poem that you're about to hear, um, which we think reflects and reinforces today's Easter Sunday message. How the Virus Stole Easter by Christy Bother with a nod to Dr. Seuss. It was late in 19 when the virus began, bringing chaos and fear to all people each land. People were sick, hospitals full, doctors overwhelmed, no one in school. As winter gave way to the promise of spring, the virus raged on, touching peasant and king. People hid in their homes from the enemy unseen. They YouTubed and Zoomed, social distanced and cleaned. April approached, church buildings were closed. There won't be an Easter, the world supposed. There won't be church services and egg hunts are out. No reason for new dresses when we can't go about. Holy Week started as bleak as the rest. The world was focused on masks and on tests. Easter can't happen, this year it proclaimed. Online and at home it just won't be the same. Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, the days came and went. The virus pressed on, it just would not relent. The world woke Sunday and nothing had changed. The virus still menaced, the people estranged. Poo-poo to the saints, the world was grumbling. 
They are finding out now that no Easter is coming. They're just waking up. We know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two, and then all the saints will all cry boo-hoo. That noise, said the world, will be something to hear. So it paused, and the world put a hand to its ear. And it did hear a sound coming through all the skies. It started down low, then it started to rise. But the sound wasn't depressed. Why, this sound was triumphant. It couldn't be so, but it grew with abundance. The world stared around, popping its eyes. Then it shook. What it saw was a shocking surprise. Every saint in every nation, the tall and the small, was celebrating Jesus in spite of it all. It hadn't stopped Easter from coming, it came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the world, with its life quite stuck in quarantine, stood puzzling and puzzling, what can this mean? It came without bonnets. It came without bunnies. It came without egg hunts, cantatas or money. Then the world thought of something it hadn't before. Maybe Easter, it thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Easter, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, the story's not done. What will you do? Will you share with that one or two or more people needing hope in this night? Will you share the source of your life in this fight? The church buildings are empty, but so is the tomb. And Jesus is victor over death, doom and gloom. So this year at Easter, let this be our prayer. As the virus still rages all around everywhere, may the world see hope when it looks at God's people. May the world see the church is not a building or steeple. May the world find faith in Jesus' death and resurrection. May the world find joy in a time of dejection. May 2020 be known as the year of survival, but not only that, let it start a revival.